c'est la vie. Oui, mais ce qui me rend triste, c'est que la vie et le roman, c'est différent. Je voudrais que ce soit pareil. Clair, logique, organisé. Mais ça ne l'est pas. Like life, Godard's 1965 film Pierrot le Fou is not clear, logical, or organized. It exemplifies much of what makes the new wave fun and important by defying what you expect a movie to be. On the fun side, it's got beautiful colors, beautiful actors, beautiful scenery, random musical sequences, meta humor that plays with Hollywood traditions and comic books and French pulp novels. But all of that fun, postmodern goofiness is a vehicle for a tragic story of murder and heartbreak. <laughs> The film kind of has a traditional three-act structure. Jean-Paul Belmondo plays a washed-up advertising exec named Ferdinand, and Anna Karina is his babysitter Marianne, who insists on calling him Pierrot. I Ferdinand. After the naive, sad clown of the Comédie de l'Arte tradition, Pierrot hates that. I Ferdinand. But Marianne is not wrong. Ferdinand ditches his career and his family to go on the lam with Marianne, who has some vague connections with gangsters in the Secret Service. They hide out in the south of France, but she gets tired of Ferdinand's pretentious ways and she sails off with her so-called brother, who's actually an ex-boyfriend from the terrorist organizations she's mixed up with. I won't spoil the ending, because it's on the poster. <laughs> Near the beginning of the film, the couple are making love in her apartment where there is a corpse and an impressive stash of firearms in the next room. These go completely unexplained. The couple drinks some coffee and contemplates the next move. She wants to hit South America. He wants to go to Italy. The body continues to be dead in the next room. It's all done in a very nonchalant fashion. Essentially, it's a postmodern version of Casino Royale, and yes, I know there is a postmodern version of Casino Royale, where the hero very slowly realizes the woman he loves is one of the bad guys. There's a scene where they sail into port, and Marianne sees an agent waiting for them, and realizes that her past will not leave her alone. And she must reunite with her terrorist ex-boyfriend. It's almost identical to the scene in 2006's Casino Royale, where Vesper Lynn sails into port and sees an agent waiting for her and realizes that her past will not leave her alone, and she must reunite with her terrorist ex-boyfriend. But the plot is of the least interest in this film. The story is absurd and feels more like a Roadrunner cartoon than a film noir. The couple performs pantomime for American sailors. That's terrific! dwarves are murdered. They hide out on a desert island reading Jules Verne. 1960s and 70s cinema was full of chaotic postmodern comedies. Belmondo did That Man from Rio, which makes Moonraker look like the right stuff. And this was not just in France. These movies were everywhere. What's New Pussycat, Batman the Movie. Someday she just can't get rid of a bomb. And of course, all the films of Mel Brooks. Isn't anybody going to help that poor man? Hush, Harriet, that's a sure way to get him killed. Oh. Just check out this scene where Ferdinand meets a random guy. A woman puts a hot track on the jukebox and starts dancing in an empty bar in the early afternoon. This guy comes in and has this surreal discussion with Ferdinand. And then he leaves. It's all very Samuel Beckett. Nothing is funnier than unhappiness, I grant you that. In game. Or I'd like well to hear him think. Perhaps he could dance first and think afterwards. It's the natural order. Waiting for Godot. <laughs> The echoes in Casino Royale are not surprising, because as much as Jean-Luc Godard was obsessed with Hollywood... Oh, yes. Hollywood. Hollywood became obsessed with Jean-Luc Godard. Godard had launched the French New Wave with Au bout de Souffle, which features Belmondo as a Bogart-obsessed petty criminal. The acting, the editing, and everything in that film changed the way that movies were ever made. In the words of Roger Ebert, if Godard is not the greatest living director, he is certainly the most audacious, the most experimental, the one who understands best how movies work. Godard kept doing weird and wonderful things, reaching peak zaniness with a near-unwatchable version of King Lear in 1989, starring Norman Mailer, Peter Sellers, 
Keller is the stage director, not the Pink Panther guy, Burgess Meredith, Molly Ringwald, and Woody Allen. Goddard's career was always about the movies, from his first Bogart-obsessed crime spree to a King Lear that ends with a fool editing footage in a studio. He gave us the savagely cynical contempt about a starlet played by uber-famous Brigitte Bardot thrust into a movie directed by Fritz Lang with Michel Piccoli and Jack Palance as unsavory characters along for the ride. Again, a completely bizarre and inspired cast. And he also made the deliciously creepy Alpha Veal, which feels like someone taking their sci-fi and film noir toys out and mashing them together. And Banda Par, which Tarantino adopted as his production company's name, and which riffs on gangster films, dance scenes, and montages. Tarantino clearly watched Banda Par on repeat while making Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs' story is Ringo Lamb's City on Fire, but the tone is all Godard. Pierre Lefou is a love letter to American cinema, done in a way that no American film could. You've got references to Laurel and Hardy. Je gangster movies, musicals, a cameo by director Sam Fuller. My name is Samuel Fuller. I'm here to make a picture in Paris called Flowers of Evil. Good day, Sylvia. Belmondo's character always trying to be a Bogart clone and failing due to his lack of Bogart's morals or courage. <laughs> Pierre Le Fou is also a love letter to art, both painting, which is everywhere in cheap prints tacked onto hotel walls, including, of course, Pierre and literature, especially adventure literature. Within 60 seconds, the film name checks Les romans de Conrad, comme dans les romans de Stevenson, comme dans les romans de Faulkner, comme dans les romans de Jacques London. And comic books. For the first half of the film, Ferdinand carries around a graphic novel, La Bande des Pieds de Nicolet. In France, graphic novels, or BD, are part of mainstream culture. Asterix, Tintin, Lucky Luke, and more adult fare like the work of Mobius, Inky Bilal, and Hugo Pratt. These are normal features of middle class life, not nerd culture specialties. This movie showcases that sensibility, partly by keeping Pied Nicolet on screen constantly, and also by treating its cinematography like a four-color fantasy. Colors are vibrant. I asked my wife why Pierrot would paint his face blue, when Pierrot's is often painted white, at least post Paul Le Grand. And she incisively said, well, this looks cooler, and I can't argue with that. Shots are set up like the cramped but carefully chosen frames in a BD quite opposite to, say, an Avengers film where shots mimics flash pages by Alex Ross. The tone also keeps that Bay Day feel, very much on the realm of Tintin. Fun and adventurous, but distant. The ending is tragic, but you can't take it seriously. <laughs> The Mediterranean Sea plays a role, just like New York in an American rom-com. At the beginning, Ferdinand is in a bathtub, reading a tiny art history book to his daughter. It's claustrophobic, just like the cocktail party scene that follows. You can feel the relief as the scope expands to southern France. The sea equals eternity, or maybe le néon, the nothingness. Godard says this almost directly at the close of the film. In the end, the whole thing was changed by the casting of Anna and Belmondo. I wanted to tell the story of the last romantic couple, the last descendants of La Nouvelle Eloise, Werther, and Herman and Dorothea. Godard, Le Cahier du Cinéma. The hero and heroine of this movie clearly have different things on their minds. There's an amateurish musical number, Maline de Chance, which highlights this. Maline de Chance! Marianne is obsessed with her fate. Saline de Chance. Ferdinand is obsessed with her hips. Saline de Hanche. Saline de Hanche. Et qu'est-ce que tu vois? Visage d'un type qui va se jeter à 100 à l'heure dans un précipice. Moi, je vois le visage d'une femme qui est amoureuse du type qui va se jeter à 100 à l'heure dans un précipice. In the end, she ruins her fate by dumping Ferdinand for her terrorist ex. Ferdinand ruins the line of her hips with, well, guns and dynamite. The ending may be my least favorite part of this movie, but it does feel a little wily e. Coyote, which I appreciate. <laughs> Given when this was made, there was a constant specter of the Vietnam War looming over it. Well, a film is uh, like a battleground. There's love, hate, action, violence, death. In one word, emotions.
Small personal acts of violence are illustrated with bigger explosions. Murders go unpunished. Bodies are walked by with no emotions from the protagonists. Ferdinand goes to the movies, and he tries to ignore the reports on Vietnam by reading Elie Thor's Histoire de l'Art. But he can't help it. He keeps looking up to watch the newsreel. We want to be distracted from tragedy by art, but our deep-down humanity won't let us entirely. Ah, la vie est triste, mais elle est toujours belle. This movie is beautiful and sad, and very funny. Pierre Le Fou is a leap into the deep end of the Nouvelle Vague pool. It's light in tone, chaotic in direction, and endlessly rewatchable. Bon, allons-y, allons-o.